Hey folks, thanks for joining us on Monday Mindshare again. And uh, like we said, we're going to uh, spend some time with all of the athletes that were in Kona uh, with the s team and uh, talk through their experience there. And always a pleasure to have our very own Matt Kerr uh, come and join us. How you doing there, buddy? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for having me back. It's yeah, great no, it's great, great to see you. Uh, a lot's happened in such a short amount of time, huh? It's it's been a uh, yeah it has it actually has I feel like I've been on the road for a little while now um, it's been a big year and if I reflect it's been a, been a huge year actually so um, yeah. yeah well hey we're, we're gonna get into Kona I mean just calling it right out of the blocks elephant in the room is what happened there on the bike at the end of the bike and uh, I'm sure it's been super hard to swallow but uh, hopefully you can. Uh, look through it and learn through it and uh, move on and I think the whole team and uh, the audience at large is keen to kind of hear just what happened there but before we jump in there um, let's just wind back because it's such it's been such a story right it's been such a journey um, it really probably since the midst of of, of COVID 2020 maybe 19 etc but Maybe to kind of reset everyone before we get into some of the detailed mat of training and racing and then the Utah experience and now the Kona experience, why don't we just walk through where you were, say, 2019, 2020 on your first Ironman, mm -hmm. and let's talk through your times, progression of times in each of those Ironman races. It'd be good just baseline for the discussion. Absolutely. Um, yeah, there's value in, in talking through that. And um you know, I reflect it's been it's been a heavy and a, and a big progressive three and a half, four years of triathlon for me. And, and that's as long as it's been. And that's all it's been. So, um, yeah, 2018 in December. So right at the end of 2018, I did my first 70.3. Um, that was New Zealand or was that? Yeah, New Zealand in December. And okay. uh, I think I went like four and a half or 425 or something uh, okay. around there. And yeah. By the way, I did my first one at uh, 434, so maybe there's hope for me to uh, have a crack at this. Uh, anyway. we, we need some. We need SPLs, uh to continue moving through. So uh, I'm a little older than you, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so that was what'd you say? 2018 and uh, end, 7.3, 430. Yeah, end, okay. end of 2018, and then uh, 2019, uh, I did uh, I'm in New Zealand in March. Uh, so, yeah, basically off the back of um, of 18, we worked through January, February in prep for a March race, first Ironman race. And yeah. I guess that's where I started on the whole low-carb approach and um, made some changes. There were some very significant changes at the time. What, what um, was the time you did there on your first? Uh, I went 9.20, 9.21. It's pretty good for your first freaking Ironman. <laughs> um so that was yeah 2019 and from there i guess i just got the uh little that little bit of a bug to want to be better to want to improve um i saw some potential to make some possible changes in what i was doing in order to uh try and get faster but uh that was 19 so then covid hits right but mm. you did some races there though no right 2020 we, we snuck in just before literally we raced again uh 12 months later i did i'm in new zealand in 2020 so that was okay. my next full distance so between okay. um and intentionally i'd left 12 months between doing an ironman and my next ironman uh so rather than trying to get another ironman in the same calendar year um my next full ironman was was exactly 12 months later at new zealand ironman in 2020 and i went uh 850 three wow um and in between in between that i dabbled with a couple of 70.3s and and uh trying to make some progress in that space and, and just learn triathlon you know learn how to ride uh learn how to run and, and that swim in the sport of triathlon as well Second as Ironman sub nine hours huh wow yeah i mean there was significant um you know emphasis put on getting to that um, sub nine hours but um, it was all achievable in a realistic world of working full-time um, and just some really intentional um, principles that we applied in order to, to to take 30 minutes off that first Ironman time and some of those things like if you look at the you think the big levers of that improvement was it like something specific you did on the bike run nutrition like I mean it's probably all of the above but I mean if you had to pick a few things you felt were real contributors 
absolutely um yeah that whole lower aerobic zone two training style of training style that was that was a huge implementation through that time and and um trying to make some gains on um bringing that aerobic zone um up and, tr and trying to see by the way when you say lower aerobic i assume you mean that's code for long slow aerobic long slow, right? long slow. yeah <laughs> and uh you know like we played with aerodynamic positions on the bike and oh, huh. um some trying to get the most speed out of of the less lesser um power to put into the bike and just be more efficient across that time uh, my running gait um yeah so a few little things like that which we saw would accumulate across 180k ac accumulate across 42k um lower the variability of power across um riding 180k to a, to a, a range that was achievable um but you weren't necessarily burning a whole lot of matches by spiking your power um and in those few levers we really pulled hard and we, we pulled hard for that time and, and we still do that construct of like consistent power and i've heard you talk about that before so it's obviously a big deal that you and grant have worked on um is is the essence of training for that like just quality like swift sessions where you're just sitting on a certain power and cadence for a longer period of time or, or is it something more specific than that i think when we get into specific training for events it it becomes that but we've also got to we've got to understand that there's got to be some polarization in our training and that training cannot consist of exactly that for 12 months of the year yeah, yeah. Um, so we go through different blocks different stages right. and different training phases um, so yeah. that what you've just described that would come at the latter part of the training before a race gotcha just your note there on there was a 12 month between your first and your second. And obviously it was your first and your second. Uh, you were you, you amateur athlete, obviously. Um, but any comment you would have is, I mean, obviously, and we'll, we'll talk about this. You're staring down the whole pro thing, but um, the, the frequency of racing full Ironman seems to be more frequent now for pros than ever before. And uh, how do you and your coach feel about that and the spirit of recovery speed and just, you know, there's the obvious tax on muscles and joints and what have you at the time of the race, but just central fatigue, mm. any kind of perspective, how you guys are thinking about that? That's certainly a thing. And I reflect on, you know, where I was and we talk about that 12 month window between an Ironman and another Ironman. And now yeah. I look at what I've achieved this year and we've, we've banked, you know, uh three ironmans in in a 12 month block so there's definitely been a change and i think that change can only come with being able to train with uh volume you know for example uh i couldn't ask myself to be putting out um uh, 18 20 hour week in the first you know uh yeah. let's say six months of training i, I yeah. think that's a learned behavior and it's a learned um, the, the more time you spend in the sport, the more adaptable your body can become and a little yeah. bit more resilient around the time. So, right. um, which only enables you to possibly race a little bit more later in a career, if we talk yeah. about that as an example. So, it's a bit uh, like Kinley, right? In Kona, right? Exactly that point. Exactly. Um, exactly. It's kind of trained intelligence through the whole physiology of the, of the guy, right? So, yeah. anyway. Um, okay. So, that was what you say, 2020. 2020. Um, 2021. Was there any racing you did? There was a bit of local, right? Yeah, there was. I mean, that was the year that I was in Australia. Right. Um, and I guess that was my, the first big step into, into putting this thing into a bit more of a, I wouldn't say professional aspect, but, 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 but more serious, you know, like I had I'd taken a, a period of time of uh, leave without pay from my permanent job. I was still working, um, but just doing that work in Australia, uh, teaching in Australia and just moved, made some decisions in order to be able to try and excel uh, my progression. So um, 2020, I got a lot of racing locally in Queensland. Um, and then I came back to New Zealand, um, hoping to get Ironman New Zealand in March. And that got, uh, that got squashed by COVID, which yeah. um, in turn, actually sent us to uh to utah 2021 well what a day that was or a whole week that was but um <clears throat> you know such a such a confidence building experience um in many regards for you and uh also just the way that you finished that race i think must be yeah like i say just a real confidence builder to think about 
it's a weapon, the run that you can put down. Um, and you know, still you're only four years in. Um, what was your what was your run time that day um, in Utah, Matt? Uh, I went two fifty seven. What do you think? Um, how much do you have a sense of how much time you think you still have to work with? Yeah, I mean, we look at that course, it was a tough course. It wasn't flat. The only flat section was about that first 500, 600 metres out of transition. Um, and I was pretty proud of that result in terms of I'd never gone under three before. And to go on that course under yeah. three um, was definitely a win. And I, I think that's dividends to the the, uh, the investment that we put through the build for that specific race. I mean, we talk about specificity and it becoming specific to what we're racing to. Getting through an Ironman of the distances is one thing, but then being able to make application to the specific location of where you're racing yeah. um, it becomes a next, next level. And that, that's huge in Kona, the likes of Kona, the likes of St. George, um, and what terrain you're actually racing on. Chelsea said, uh, in fact, a few interviews that you know, being a track or, or a runner, if you will, she's, uh, she's put down a 15, 10, 5k. Mm -hmm. As you think about the likes of Gustav and others, um, you know, kind of more recently, recent years transitioning into long course uh, racing. Um, how do you feel about the need to kind of spend time on the track and just prove to yourself that you can also put down just a raw speed 10k or 5k on a track like do you think that's a factor you as you think about these guys now running 230 highs uh mid 230s um in Kona, what do you think you need to have speed legs of on the track i mean do you, do you, do you make any correlation there or any thought about that um, i see the correlation and you know if we can lift those values at the lower end at the five or the 10 K we can pull those threshold values up. And certainly it's going to lift the level ladder down, down the, down the bar to those aerobic aerobic zones for sure. Um, I don't see it being the be all and end all no, of being able to run a two forty something. Right. right. Um, it's, and it's, if you look at the times, it's more about consistency across that. And yes, you've got to be able to run that speed. Um, and yes, I include that in training, um, but it's, I wouldn't put it, all my eggs in that basket saying um, that's an absolute yeah. must. I mean, the thing about all these, probably the top five athletes on both the ladies and the men, it's not like you can look at any part of their day in Kona and say that, well, that was a little off. I mean, they all had great swims, great bikes, great runs. Yeah. So uh, anyway, well, Hey, um, yeah. Coming out of 21, um, it, it was kind of 22, but as the 21 Ironman world champion age grouper, You've got that under your belt. You obviously go to spend time in Maui, get a ton of more training time with Brayden. Mm. And, you know, we were just crushed also with, with Brayden coming down with something there that uh, affected him on race day too. It felt, felt like the whole New Zealand team was uh, under attack, uh, quite frankly. Yeah, um, yeah Carl, Carl Smith as well. And, Carl, um, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, but anyway, I think um, just watching, you know, from a distance, you guys putting down the, the that last block, if you will, in Maui and then coming over to Kona, when you got to Kona and then you really kind of spent time on the course and obviously on race day, as you kind of compare uh, Utah versus Kona, um, you know, you only have to look at the finish times of the top 10 of those two races and realize they're quite different courses, different environment what would your kind of observations be um you know between the two between the two yeah i mean there was this preconceived idea even prepping in maui the difference between the two and for us um the cooling and staying cool was was the biggest factor and the biggest differential between the two races and that's probably humidity right it's not it's not just raw heat because utah had it absolutely it did and we both experienced it right right yeah, yeah. <laughs> even if i wasn't running i still felt it <laughs> absolutely um so, and, and i think that that's you know utah the heat is something to be mindful of absolutely it's a huge important factor but it seems a lot more controllable right uh, a lot more you have more control of it with um the humidity side of things it's just not cooling you so yeah. you've got to take other actions in order to be able to cool yourself and stay cool because i think and we saw it in training. Once we got past that point, there's no coming back. 
Yeah. Um, great. Yeah. So that, that and was there the- is a much greater um, heart rate drift with that heat. You see, did you see that in your heart heart rate data? Hugely. Yeah. Hugely. Yeah. 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 Until we started applying some of these fundamental, what we learned to be principles of staying cool, staying hydrated. Um, that drift, I mean, once it, once it's up, it's up and it's yeah. so hard to get down when yeah. you, it's almost impossible to get down while you're still exercising. Yeah. Well, even, um, I mean, when we lived in Hong Kong, we do a lot of ultra running through the summer there in the mountains. And frankly, even after you stop the session, it would still be a half an hour, an hour before you really see everything's coming back into normal, normal values, if you will. I mean, you've got your just your general drop from going from training to stopping, but there was clearly an elevation just from the heat that was kind of resident um, yeah. uh, in your system. So yeah, interesting. That's so, yeah, so true. And, you know, we were playing with a lot of different variables around weight and uh, weighing pre and post trainings and seeing what the yep. difference was. And, and ultimately it wasn't all about loss. There was, there was obviously energy expenditure going on and there's some loss happening there, but um, yeah, we're trying to minimize that deficit as much as possible. The um, you know, Dan has a bunch of oh, courseware also on uh, heat adaption, etc. Mm-hmm. Outside of being in Maui, did you guys felt like you need to do anything more than just being in Maui, or you did time in saunas, or any of this kind of thing? Or yeah, and and like I'm a huge fan of saunas, and and uh, outside of I guess prepping for a hot race. Um, I will spend time in the sauna, whether it's for those physiological adaptations or whether it's just for a mental stimulus of, um, of getting through a day. It's, um, yeah. There's obviously that aspect to it as well as the heat acclimatation, but um, I think it's quite powerful in the sense of the mind. Yeah. Um, on race day, uh, it was really palpable uh, in the women's race uh, and Chelsea was such a role model of this in going through the aid stations, took time, ice in the hat, you know, it was, it was kind of one of those, you always, you know, you and I talked about this, Grant talked about in terms of the whole hat versus visor question, but it, it, it does kind of beg the question of, you know, being able to hold the ice, obviously you can in your suit. Um, there's a bunch of research talks about having the ice in your hands, which where a lot of the heat transfer happens. Mm-hmm. what's your approach and how do you think about you know, just the use of ice in, in heat hot racing? Yeah. I, I, like that was a prime example and it offered us a little bit of reassurance watching those women go through on Thursday. And I think Chelsea did it very well. She was controlled. She used the aid stations to her, you know, maximal potential. Um, yeah. And she didn't quite come to a, a stop or a, right. through any of them. She was still, she was still walking and jogging um, in terms yeah. of the ice that was something we experimented with in Maui and it played a huge part, you know, evidence and research shows that the max, the, the most effective way to dump heat is through hands, feet and, and face. Right. Um, and the exposure of the hands, we saw considerable, um, you know, session off session of session where it was effective and particularly in the run and we're offered that ice through the run. So um, that was a win. That was a bonus and actually just keeping our body cool through that mechanism only um, yeah what was huge interesting yeah well let's let's talk about Kona um you were on the second wave I think it was right on the Saturday is that right yeah yeah so that was yeah the 35 to 39s went off first and then I was in the 30 to 34 which is about five minutes later okay okay how many was in that um uh, in that wave do you, do you uh 621 wow. I think it was yeah it was a fair amount that's a good that's a solid wave yeah I mean yeah it kind of felt like it was triathlon again to see these big waves all going off together. It's been so long and one at a time kind of thing. So um, tell us about the swim. It's obviously a magic part of the world to swim with turtles and fish and all that. You're obviously going pretty hard at it though, but tell us about the swim. Yeah, the swim start was something I've never experienced before. Uh, really? I thought really. with all your uh, surf life saving you. And water polo, right? <laughs> <laughs> I know and um, you know and in the NZ I think we're one of the only races that still have the mass start for Ironman um, so this was a mass start for 600 people but it was controlled in such a small area right. that it created so much um, I would imagine for those that are not that confident 
in the water, anxiety. Yeah. I can see yeah. how it happens. People talk about it. I can see yeah. exactly how it happens. So, yeah. um, you know, we're shoulder to shoulder between two boys. We've got surfboards out the front trying to keep us from going past those two boys. And naturally to stay afloat, uh, you sort of scull with your hands and keep your legs nice and wide. But you couldn't do that because there's so many people there. Yeah, right. Uh, so that in itself was a bit of an experience to start. Um, and then once the gun went, it was uh, it was do your best to get out the front as fast as you can because that's in your best interest to uh, not get trampled through. So um, to be honest, the swim felt really controlled, really, I wouldn't say easy, but um, I was, yeah, it was a super easy swim to be fair. I've, I've swum harder in Ironmans and um, I came out at 52, which I was stoked about. Um, in fact, what, I was- no, Sorry, which spot? Uh, 50, oh, like 50, I swam in 52. Oh wow! Yeah, and so, what what place were you there, Matt, with, uh, with your group? Your no, um, on the f- seventh overall, I believe. Okay, okay. Um, so you had a good swim. So it was reasonable. It put me in a good position, I guess. And um, yeah, I, we we obviously got through the back end of that first wave and started swimming through them on the second part of the course. Right. Um, but to be honest, I mean the swim. As I say, I wasn't exerting too much, and I was anticipating a fifty four fifty five. So be happy things are feeling good things are feeling yeah. good yeah well good so then uh coming onto the bike um you know you've obviously been you're in kona for a week or so you're kind of familiar with the course to some degree um I, i'm going to ask everyone this as they come through uh these interviews we're doing palani um mm-hmm. everyone talks about all the commentators talk about i could imagine running up that would be absolute pain in the butt but um is it that bad biking up it or what am I missing something? I don't think it was, it wasn't that bad made solely from the spectators that were there. <laughs> uh, you know, I actually had a, a guy in front of me on the bike and he was, he was interacting with the crowd. He had his hands up. He was getting them, getting them racking up. So that probably helped it a little bit, but um, mate, I've never been through so many people before. And Pilani was like a particularly a prime spot for all the spectators to be um because you're only traveling at a at a a yeah slow slow speed so you're kind of absorbing that a little bit and uh yeah yeah you're just mindful not to be uh what you think is like 200 or 280 watts you're sitting on like 400 watts you know but um (laughs) yeah it's pretty spectacular i mean it wasn't yeah it was i didn't find it too too exacerbating to get up too tough yeah okay so you get out on the queen k head out towards harvey um just tell us a little bit about what your plan was and whether you went to plan in terms of intensity for that uh first half and then obviously we'll get into the second half yeah right um yeah out to harvey was all pretty straightforward um you got that little out and back before you actually get on the queen k yeah um and the plan was to to ride 280 um and you know if that fell in the 270s then that's cool that's all right um but it was like 280 was that number that we were were targeting um i think for me a a huge win out of that and i felt that i was making um substantial progress across other athletes is having a larger chain ring a lot of guys were spinning out um on some of those descents on particularly on queen k um so i think just staying aero and again riding that that set wattage that I had for me, it was 280, um, down some of those descents. And yep, you're traveling at 70K, yeah. uh, but you're in error and you're sticking on that power. I was, you know, there was bunches I was just going through. Wow. Um, whereas I think a lot of people might not have had the gearing set up where they were able to do that. So if they were riding 260, all of a sudden they were dropping back to, 140 watts down those descents and not actually maximizing that and getting the speed for return yeah interesting yeah um, you yeah you'd you'd ridden up to the harvey um during the time you were in kona before the race uh what's your perspective i felt like it was you know i don't know what's probably 10 10 kilometers something like that from the bottom to the to the by the time you had the turnaround yeah it's not it's not um aggressive hill it's a bit of a grind but um what kind of wattage were you putting in the same through same exactly the same yeah yeah and and for me that number was like if it got steep enough that i was uh i dropped under you know 23 24 it was an opportunity to get up on the base bars 
Uh, okay. But any that's kilometers per hour, anything over that, um, I was still in aero position. So wattage oh. would be the same. And and to be fair, a lot of what I remember through that climb was actually you're sitting on 28, 29, 30, um, making that climb. It's quite deceptive. Um, it's a yeah, climb, it but you're still getting speed, right? So it's kind of how does that yeah. work? But I was I, uh, I did a few rounds on the full gas system before going there for the seventy point three, um, and you get a sense for it. But when you're there, it is they are deceptive hills. It's they're rolling backwards and forwards. You don't realize there's actually quite a bit of elevation in that. Just getting out to Harvey. Yeah, and a lot of people talk about Harvey's just straight down to the turn. Uh, you know, once you reach the turn around and come come back, it's like straight down. Well, it's not. There's, there's uh, what you just described exactly that rolling. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so, yeah, coming down off Harvey, um, obviously you're hitting pretty good speeds there too, right? And you can really um, put some distance in a quick amount of time. Yeah. Um, you know, like I was, I guess, a little bit uh, anxious going into going into that descent. Um, I'd been out on a training ride and I'd, I'd just finished and my support vehicle had come across and we were loading that up with, with the uh, bike and stuff. And we're pulled well off to the side and uh, we look around and this truck came through on the, it was on the Queen K and he came through and I literally watched the, this truck pick up and just the wind blew the cyclist straight off his bike uh, and, and into the gutter. So that kind of put things into perspective how windy it can be. Yeah. Um, he must've just got a, a catch of a crosswind and the truck's wind and, and he was uh he was off in an ambulance. So, um, and then, you know, I take my training wheels off and put race wheels on all of a sudden you're a little bit more susceptible to be blown around a bit. So, um, but actually the wind wasn't as, it didn't throw me around as much as I could, whether I was just in the air and, and holding that consistent position um, through that descent and trying to maintain that 280. Yeah. I think, I think you kind of offset that, that wind a little bit when it does come through. Right. Um, there's little things that you can do to predict when you're going to get a crosswind. You're looking at what's blowing. If you've got, a, if, if you're coming up to the back end of a cyclist, what they're doing, whether they're being blown around Yeah. And, and you can kind of brace for that a little bit. So um, yeah, it wasn't too bad. Now, what was the fuel plan in terms of how much race plus did you have on board? Um, what kind of consumption patterns were you working to? Yeah, so I was operating all off Race Plus. Um, I had that in a front hydration system there, which was fixed on the bike, so that couldn't go anywhere. I also had a tube bottle that was full of Race Plus as well. Um, now, this is the gel formula you use, but in a concentrate. Is that, that's, that's how you're doing it? Yeah, and I also, um, I concentrated it enough to be able to put in a bottle exactly as you're exactly that bottle that you just had a sip on uh enough for that to still flow out of the the mouthpiece and not be you know the concentrate that is in a uh in a squeezy gel for example is too thick for that to come out um so adding quite a bit of water to that and okay. you know we're looking at it was around uh i have to look exactly what those those numbers were but it was around the 70 grams um an hour Kind so we're, we're kind of on the high side to be honest um but we're on high intensity right so i mean yeah no and, surprise. yeah <laughs> and then you know like the aid stations were really just a, a time to um what i'd do is i'd go through we had those really quick um valve bottles and the first one i'd grab it would go straight through my helmet and it would come over me so that that would be a cooling bottle cooling. and then the other bottle would be straight into the fuel cell on my bike um, and that would just be a supplement hydration um, to to the concentrate that I was sipping through the, the energy. Yeah, yeah. So now we come to the roll back from Harvey all the way back. And where did the accident happen and what happened? Um, the whole team was devastated to see you watching the tracker and suddenly nothing was happening on the tracker. Um, why don't you walk us through and to what level of detail you wish or don't wish to tell us. Yeah, for sure. I probably rode, uh, to be fair, I was, I was riding harder on the way home than I was on the way up. Huh. Um, and just, I wouldn't say there's that conservative approach on the way up, but um, definitely I, I had more power on the second split coming home. So you're feeling um, good and ready pretty to good. run. I was ready for, ready for a running race. I, I knew that I wasn't out the front. Um, <laughs> I was possibly in second or third. And it turns out I was, I was in third at about, um just over three minutes back um and i was ready to run legs were feeling good 
and we'd, we'd written to powwows probably looking at a two Oh, sorry, uh, let's say 4.34 roughly by the time I got into transition, 4.35. So nothing crazy, but it was still a solid ride. Yeah. Um, come off the Queen K, you make a right and you go through a bit of an industrial area. Uh, I was by myself at the time and the roads are all closed, double laned. And you come down a bit of a descent. So I picked up quite a bit of speed and then you're onto a bit of a flat before we had to make a, a turn through an intersection left to, to get down to transition. And, right. uh, so, so at this point I was probably like two kilometers, one and a half, two kilometers out of transition. So pretty close to home. Oh, it's close. Wow. Uh, dialing back the gears, trying to get the cadence up, just get the legs moving a little bit more, getting some blood flow through there. And um, yeah, I looked up and it was quite a way ahead. I couldn't tell you the distance, but this lady stepped off the footpath um and she began to cross the road and the road was completely closed we had police either side sort of on the intersections and yeah it took me a bit to respond to actually what was happening and obviously the first instinct was to to yell um to i can't even remember what i said maybe like oi or something like that and um thinking that i, I would hold hold the line i was riding and she'd hear me and I'd avoid that real awkward, you know, do you go back? Do I go forward? What's happening here? I'll hold my line. She'll hear me. She'll get a fright. She'll stop if anything. And I'll sneak through the gap and, uh, and we'll come out the other side. Sweet. Um, but yeah, she, she didn't hear me. And obviously as I, I approached her and got closer um, and the, these things happen pretty quick. I was traveling yeah. quite, quite fast. Um, yeah. I progressively yelled louder and louder and uh, she, she didn't have any headphones in. She just, was oblivious to me yelling quite fixated on, on crossing the road like that it was almost like there was no peripheral vision in, uh -huh. in any of her sight and um yeah at that point it was too late for me to to, to find her swerve at that, that kind of speed so um it was a head on or head on to her side basically and um she cleaned both of us out i mean she came off a lot worse than what i did um and she frankly i think when i reflect upon it took like a hundred percent of the impact, oh. you know, um, I have, I've got some road rash, but I don't think it's to the degree that I would have suffered if I had have come off at 60 kilometers an hour, you know, I might've only sure. come off at, 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 at a reduced rate because of the impact that she took, that she wore. Wow. And like when you came off, did like, did you have a sense whether there was things broken or like things was moving immediately or you had to lie for a while? Like, yeah, I, I guess by the time I came around, uh, not that I was blacked out at any point, I do remember the whole thing. Uh, we were definitely, the two of us were separate. I was one in front of her just from the, the impact and the place I'd slid across on my bike. And um, yeah, like I obviously had like skin pain around the road rash. Um, but the major pain that I was feeling was was in my wrist and in oh, right. my right leg, which I think is actually probably the the one limb that's got between the impact. Uh, not quite sure how, but I think that's that's where I've suffered most of the ongoing stress right. post this incident. That's where I've had the most swelling. That's where my bones are still real tender to touch, and there's obviously internal bruising going on there. So I guess that's the limb that copped it all, and. Um, yeah, there was pain and, and whatnot around there. Boy, yeah, it's just it's just a it's just, just such a shock. Um, these as these things are, um, and we know you 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 had time to get you know appropriate medical attention on it the day after the race. Mm -hmm. um, thankfully, nothing's broken, as we understand, right? Absolutely, and you know, I, I guess the more I reflect upon it, the more thankful I am that that that's the situation that I'm in. I mean. Uh, the bike is that's pretty much written off but in that case you know better that than me to be fair yeah yeah um well yeah. here's the here's the thing that uh anyone who was watching on the day was just scratching their head is that you somehow continued to transition zone and you put shoes on and went and ran a marathon uh what was the the mental internal kind of thought process to come off that type of accident and to come into the, the transition and there's kind of want and feeling you want to are kind of two different things mm. to do a marathon right yeah I, I guess lying on the road at that point in time you know the first instinct for me was to 
right, I'm back on my bike and I'm getting into transition. I've just come off my bike. That's all it is. And then, you know, there's five seconds later, you lie there and actually that's not possible right at this point in time. And you go through the thought process of, um, yeah, getting all of that medical stuff out of the way. And for me, the, the completion factor was driven by a few things. Um, it was driven by, and, and I guess one of the first thoughts is, um, and a lot of people have heard me talk about this, is the hierarchy of goals going into a race. And, and for that for that race particularly, uh, the first one was to get to the start line. The second one was to complete. And then we had a swim, bike, and a run goals or goal as such. And quite early on in that accident, the second one was like, well, a goal of mine is to finish this. Like I want, I, I do wish to finish this. If I'm in a capacity where I'm able to move uh, or at least attempt to get through a segment of the run, whether that be one kilometer, five kilometers or 42 of those Ks, then I'll give it my best shot, you know? Um, and maybe this race has a little bit more significance than say an Ironman New Zealand or Australasian race, because it's the world champs, it's Kona. Um, there's a little bit riding on it. I've got family, I've got friends here um i've got sponsors looking at me they've supported me to this to this um but i wouldn't say that that's the underpinning foundation of why i continued like that's part of it totally um but i guess my personal um, thought process of packing up and going home at midday after that accident to sitting on the couch that afternoon thinking could have i been in a state where i could have at least attempted 1k or two kilometers of that uh, versus going out and only getting through 10 kilometers and then calling it a day, at least I would have gone home knowing the fact that I'd given it my best yeah. shot, I'd attempted. And if I got through 42, it was a bonus, you know, it was a bonus, but at least I would have given myself the personal satisfaction of giving it everything that I had on that particular day. Yeah, it's just unreal just to see, again, from a distance when you're watching the tracker, as you know, it's just the times that are coming up and just, I'm sure there were so many of us just kind of scratching our head and how is this possible? Mm -hmm. um, you come out of transition zone, um, the the legs and way, where, the, where the fall had happened, I assume that was swollen, but I imagine the swelling happened a lot progressively after the race, if you will, um but at that point in the race i would imagine range of movement was fairly constrained limited um, right yeah limited yeah yeah i mean i'd i'd con i was convinced that i was walking 42 kilometers and a good friend of ours that um actually with north harbour tri club who raced on the thursday uh, i witnessed him walk the entire 42 kilometers uh turns out he had COVID. um but you know i'm like well it happens people yeah. do it um, so I walked out of transition thinking here I am walking well at least attempting to start a marathon walk and um, that was probably the hardest bit to be honest yeah. is, is walking out of transition with at that point everyone's running right right uh, they're into the run they got freshish legs for the run yeah. uh, you've got thousands of people out of transition up Palani uh, and here I am I've just had my day absolutely stripped from what I thought it was going to be Right. and i'm meant to be enjoying this moment well yeah. it's like the furthest thing from enjoyment at the moment you know and uh, then you come across your friends and family and it's a t it's a it was really tough to get through and i was really emotional yeah um because the last thing you want to be doing is going through that that uh that area in tears which was happening it was like yeah. it was a hard thing to get through yeah i bet i bet yeah and just uh I, I can't imagine just how you the courage to uh, continue there was just something inspirational for all of us. I mean, I'm sure maybe we can talk about it, what you took away from having to survive the marathon like that. But I can tell you, Matt, on behalf of the whole team, it was a total inspiration that day for, you know, 25 reasons why you shouldn't continue uh, to continue. And, um, you know, we talk at our company about going longer. It was just the epitome of that. So, you know, thank you for that. It was, it was a real inspiration. Um, maybe touch on that a little bit. Um, what, did, what do you take away from when a, when a day doesn't go like you planned and then after the race, the week after the race and you reflect back on it, you know, is it a, you know, that's why we do this sport. Is it mm -hmm. a, that's what I learned when I'm going to be out there. It's never going to be as hard as this again. Like, how do you think about it? 
Yeah, I've always been told by Grant, he said, you're going to have your hard days. You will always have things that don't go your way. And to be fair and touch wood, like I've had a pretty good run so far. Um, as I say, I touch wood, I haven't had a mechanical, I haven't had a flat. And he said, your day will come. It'll come at some point and it's character building and you need to learn how you get through that. And this day did come, it finally came. And yeah. it probably came to the extent that we wouldn't have wished upon. Yeah. Um, but it tested me in terms of how to um, how to deal with it. And, you know, I'm sort of walking through the first part of Alihi Drive and uh, Grant came out to me and he's he was on his bike and he spent a couple of minutes riding by my side and he said, it's happened, it's done. And I acknowledge that. I knew that that was the stage we were at. And he said, it's not about what's happened. It's about how we deal with this afterwards, you know, um, which I think kind of speaks to where we went with it. And for me, as I say, if I only got through five kilometers of the run, at least I got through as far as I could physically. And that was going to be the stopper. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was a, it was a 42 kilometer time to reflect, to think about yeah. And uh, just acknowledge what had happened, but also um, yeah, apply some principles to, to deal with that happening. How much of that run was walk? How much was it run in the end? The first, uh, you know, halfway down Ali, it was, it was, it was walking. And then I, I got into a bit of a jog, bit of a pace and uh, pretty much up until, I guess, let's say the energy lab there we were, I was jogging. Okay. I was in, definitely discomfort um and then pretty much from the energy lab back home was a run walk and we, we got to the point where actually the swelling was that significant that it limited the range of movement through my yeah. ankle yeah. Uh, and I just I had to walk and you know you're in your bouncy shoes and all that sort of stuff but those yeah. shoes are just not made to be not running made for it five five and a half minute k's so um I wasn't you know and a lot of people would say well you probably did more damage getting through that 42k but that damage was possibly could be more emotionally if I didn't give myself the opportunity yeah. to try and get through that, you know, and, and that's where I might've suffered a little bit more emotional damage after that. And um, yeah, well said. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. Um, well, and some would argue that uh, keeping movement through those joints at those times also a positive thing, but I can't imagine how painful it was. Um well, hey, uh, it was, as I said, just uh, inspiration to all of us. And um, you wouldn't wish it on your, you know, your worst enemy, something like that. Um, but I mean, just the way that you've taken it, the professionalism that you've learned from it and put it in your, you know, your bag of experience and uh, and move, move onwards. Let's talk about 2023. Um, as you look around the world, I mean, racing is you know, post COVID with the PTL and what have you, it's opening up uh, a range of opportunities uh, around the world, obviously financially, but obviously just different types of racing. Uh, how, how are you guys in team Kerr thinking about uh, 2023? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, digesting this one is a hard one and it's, it's, uh, but, but looking ahead is, is, is exciting and, um, you know, it's a speed bump, but it's a speed bump that we're learning from. So um, it definitely does present some fantastic opportunities moving through to next year. Um, it, it, it hasn't changed, I guess, where we're thinking with this, you know, it's, it's not like and this was always going to be a progressional race to, to move into the pro race, pro field. Um, so it hasn't hindered or stopped that. I haven't, I'm itching more, you know, I've got that fire to, to carry on, to keep going and, uh, and continue that pursuit to be better and actually learn a heck of a lot more what professional racing has to offer than age group racing. Cause I think for me, that's the most natural progression, um, in terms of what races coming up and, you know, PTO and all, all that sort of stuff, the opportunities, I think, um, this is a really good time to digest what that looks like. And, um, you know, I've, I've still got that feeling of, we didn't get to test everything we wanted to and i've got that little bit of unfinished business which is quite hard to just everyone says we'll go get some rest and recovery but it's quite hard to do at this point in time but i guess that's a bit of a side distraction right now for me to think about what does next year look like and how can we plan that um to be viable sustainably from a financial perspective but also to to get the most out of a calendar race year um with with travel and, and what i've experienced this year because it's it's been a heck of a year i've learned so much and um there's things i'd do there's things i wouldn't do again 
um, and all the things that I changed. So um, we're really looking forward to, to getting into that, that pro, pro status and um, learning a lot more in that area. You think you're, um, as you go from whenever the time is that you go from age group to pro, um, from a training perspective, like, is it more of the same or there's something peculiar that has to make a bit of a right hand turn, you think? Yeah, good question. Um, I, you know, like the, the, the um, sort of dynamics of pro racing is so different to age group racing. And I think that that's the major change that needs to be implemented within a training program. It's not necessarily about going out there and doing an extra 10 hours just because you've got a label of being a professional. It's like, how do I still make the hours that I'm training adaptable to the race that I'm racing, if that makes sense? Yeah. Um, so, you know, like we, we look at some of that cycling, for example, and, and there's a lot more surging going on. There's a lot more... Um, you need to have the ability to be able to ride at a higher power for sure. I get that. And, and, but how do you do that in a manner that you can um, ride with a group, ride with a pack? So I think it's not necessarily about banking more hours. It's just about adapting to, to the, um, to the specific race. And if we yeah. talk about that, that's, that's at pro racing. Well, hey, we've done the math on your 52 swim, 434 bike, and we know what you ran at Utah. And we looked at where the guy who won this year and kind of crossed the line, uh, we we have full confidence in, in, in you know, where you can be, um, where you should be, where you earned to be. And uh, it's just a matter of time. So uh, we're all in your corner and uh, we're jazzed about, 2023 and that you're recovering quick and um hope you get some time with your family back home in new zealand when you get there mm -hmm. i'm sure they'll be uh totally wrapped to see you since you've been on the road for so long and um we're looking forward to uh to teaming up in 2023 and getting on the start line again awesome dude it's uh it's been a pleasure and um you know, we've we've had a we've had a journey this year, and it's been fantastic. So um, it's the support that you guys have given given me to get to where I am, and uh, yeah, that's what happened on the day. And, and who would have known what happened after the after the bike and on the run? But um, it's just unfinished business, and and we learn from that, move on, and um, and carry on. So we can't wait for the next year to roll through. Exactly. All right, buddy. Well, good to talk to you again. Safe travels from uh, US, California, uh, west uh, west side of the country, and uh, heading back to New Zealand. That's quite a, a marathon you got ahead of you there. Yeah, another, another one, hey? Another one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, bud. We'll stay safe and be good, and we'll catch up soon. And um, from the whole team, thanks again for the support. Awesome, dude. Thank you so much. All right, folks, thanks again for joining us on the Monday Mindshare. We'll be sure to bring up uh, some of the other athletes who are in Kona in the past uh, few weeks, and um, we'll make sure that they all get a chance to talk their story and their journey uh, heading into Kona and uh, on race day. Thanks again for joining us. Talk soon. Bye.